Remember the stories that kept you awake at night. I'm living in that closet, Dr. Fenner. Can you still hear the screams? I love having the children for dinner. All from your television set. In the night gallery. A dark side. Midnight Viewing. The Horror Anthology Podcast. Join hosts Father Malone, Mike White, and Chris Stashew as they exhume some of the most infamous horror television of all time. Midnight Viewing. From Weirding Way Media. Until next time. Weirding Way Media. Back to Midnight Viewing, the Horror Anthology Podcast, where this season we're taking a look at George A. Romero's 1980s series, Tales from the Dark Side. I'm your host, Father Malone, and sharing the Midnight View with me are the Culture Cast's Chris Stashu. You know, I have heard that if the glove fits, you must acquit. Also with me from the projection booth, it's Mr. Mike White. We are very far away from Lorenzo St. Dubois. Tonight we're taking a look at two episodes from season one. They are If the Shoe Fits... And Levitation, If the Shoe Fits, Season 1, Episode 18, originally aired on May the 12th, 1985. This one was written by N. Ward and Armand Mastriani, story by Louis Haver, directed by Armand Mastriani, and starring Dick Sean, Harry Goes, and John Zarkin. Oh, boy. Go ahead. Tell us what this one's about without wading right into it. Okay. It's about a corn pone southern politician who checks into a hotel on the night before or the day before his some big political rally that's going to go on. And the hotel is, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Somebody, somebody jump in. I, I mean, help I, him, I, Mike, I, help him. I'm taking apart the, the political fucking shadows being thrown here. What is this story about? It, I guess it's a, a bellboy who didn't get his tip so he's now torturing this guy by giving him fake clothes but also giving him hallucinations i think that's what it is was i think he dosed this guy <laughs> was it about the tip was it about the no it gratuity wasn't. i mean because no, no, nothing I, you know there's no motivation other than you sir are a clown so i'm going to dress you like a clown but really you're not but you are but you're not i don't even remember how this one ended i was so frustrated by this whole thing oh and also there's the uh, there's mimi who shows up every once in a while yeah it's a three-hander mm. mm. four technically because there's also his 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 campaign manager mm -hmm. can we just talk about what this is actually about this is called don't be a politic and politicker gotta speak the truth don't flip flop don't waffle now boy it's that shit, right? It's like, you're, you talk too fast, and we're going to show you what that means. It's like, okay, he's getting his just desserts. That could have been the name of this episode Is just as right? easily. I didn't he's, get any of that corn pone stuff that you're talking about. I, mean, I just like, got that it, he's a jerk. I, but, like, the, the name Bo Gums, I don't know. Like, yeah. he just see, he, look, it's clearly supposed to be this is a politician who doesn't believe a word that he says, and he's just there to entertain the people. So, what does that mean? Well, he's a clown. So how do they dress him up? Literally like a clown. But hiss. I can hear them hitting the hi hat from over here. It is a blackout sketch. It, I, I, it so was, yeah. Twenty two minutes of it too. Minutes. The yeah. audacity of this show. I mean Good I, Lord. Last time we were together, I talked about how I was really feeling the commercial breaks. I was so feeling it here too, because I was every time they would fade to black, I'm like, 
there's more of this is that oh my god when is this going to be over every every blackout just reminded me of how long this was dick sean is always a joy to watch no matter what he's doing sometimes and, he gets a but, little long in the tooth sometimes he gets a little long in the tooth there's the moment here where he's performing for the bellhop basically and like laying out exactly who he is as a human being and it's so theatrical and so just over the top that by the time he's got his own bow tie wrapped around his head i was expecting him to proposition the bellboy yeah i could see that free sauce in every pot a lot of barbecue talk apparently that's how you win votes in the south is barbecue we know we're in the south because of dick sean's accent even if the other characters don't have one of their own I'll say, I'll say it again. But yeah, well, I was waiting for fucking Foghorn Leghorn to walk through the goddamn door with this southern accent. Got to put a little bit of sugar on it just for the boys upstairs. I just I kept mean, thinking of facing the crowd, the Andy Griffith film, where he's the corn pone guy, but he's very evil. And I was just like, man, I wish I was watching that instead. That's such a better movie. But that's the thing. This guy is evil, right? It's just like this is I guess here's the problem, not to get political or anything, but it's really boring when evil is this fucking stupid, huh? Mm -hmm. Because that's the reality. Look, all of the morons with the three letter abbreviations that sit and be fucking stupid all the time are looking at this going, what's wrong? This is the kind of bullshit that I do. And that's the problem. This is literally, it's not, it's like that movie we made everybody so mad about Civil War. It's like, is this funny or is this just a sad fucking reflection on the world right now, which was technically the world when they made this? Nothing has changed. Politicians are still the same. And we're surprised when they don't act like pandering dickheads, which is exactly what he's playing. Dick Sean is playing the most pandering of pandering politicians. He'll say anything and do anything to get people to pay attention to him, but he has absolutely no moral standing on anything and has nothing to say in reality. Yeah. In, in yeah, this isn't saying anything new about anything. No. It's just putting him in a clown suit. And I'm like, okay, I could see that in a political cartoon, but yeah. it doesn't, it's not pushing the envelope. It's not being edgy. That's for sure. And I have a feeling they think they're being very edgy with this. Putting a politician in a clown outfit wouldn't even be edgy now. Anyways, no. like, at this point, a political cartoon showing anybody as a clown is like, do one more, please. Cause this is not scathing. There's no bite here. This is completely toothless. Now give me a Ronald McDonald crucified. It's that level of political satire going on. Yeah. <clears throat> crucified with French fries through each hand. I, this episode was not only set bound, it felt stage bound. Oh boy. Like yeah. those old, remember, remember when the HBO used to do theatrical broadcasts of like Broadway performances? I saw one of uh, Sherlock Holmes with Frank Langella. It was captivating. Ooh, wow. I was thinking about that a lot while I was watching this episode because there was not really much here at all again you, you guys said it is a blackout sketch stretched to 22 minutes it's absolutely absurd i do like uh, that he has on bermuda shorts that are star spangled they seem to me i guarantee you those are left over from the bicentennial somebody bought those <laughs> at the thrift store that was my favorite part of this episode was those bermuda shorts i asked if they were getting revenge on him for not tipping because I wrote in my notes here, do so he believe that a campaign button is a gratuity because it is not. At least he's not spending people's money unnecessarily because there's no way that it's his money anyways. Right. Yeah. Nobody's giving him gold bars or anything. <laughs> he's not selling sneakers or anything. Right. Yeah. It'd be weird if somebody were to do that. I got a total, uh, stop making sense vibe when they finally get him into that clown outfit yes <laughs> totally his girlfriend is better as just walks out to just fucking <laughs> take <laughs> me to the river <laughs> god i and actually the thing i couldn't get past is every time they said mr gums all i could think was you a great big fat person <laughs> yeah mr what gums the, what just... the in the fucking basket like that's all i can think of it's one letter away Come oh on. well and then to call somebody mr gums too sounds like he's some sort of dental freak like dr four Giggles. out of five dentists do not like mr gums no no i said dick sean is like way over the top here but 
well, I think the problem is Dick Sean is doing his damnedest to make this comedy episode actually have some comedy in it. Right. Oh, totally. Because mm-hmm. the script is not helping at all. Boy, that apple that the maid bit into, that really pays off at the end, what? doesn't it? Oh, my God. Why didn't he leave with his manager? His manager shows up sees him in his regular clothing, convinces him that he's in his regular clothing, and then he says, no, I'm going to stick around with the fucking crazy mirror and this weirdo staff from the Twilight Zone, basically. Oh, yeah. I Yeah. There were so many questions and so many just... But I didn't care. I was like, I, is it the hotel doing this? Is it the bellboy? But then after a while, I was like, I, I just don't care. And I kept thinking with the bellboy or, uh, that he reminded me so much of that guy from 30 Rock. And I was just like, oh, I wonder what that guy's up to. And just oh, Jack McBrayer yeah, just started like going off into this little Jack McBrayer fantasy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was spinning other things. He was good at. Yeah. So kind of look like William Cat with a different face. Yeah. You kind of see that. Yeah. You know, I worked at a haunted attraction here in Las Vegas for a few years. And on occasion, I would have to dress as a clown to scare tourists. And I remember putting the clown shoes on for the first time. My, I have 13 inch feet so i remember putting clown shoes on for the first time and going wow these are great yeah i was about to say that doesn't sound like a real problem Mm -hmm. i look like i have clown shoes on when i wear giant converse so yeah it's a problem as it is also the the costumes that they're wearing one is a bellboy and then the other one is a traditional french maid oh yes but it just looks like she's cosplaying as magenta from rocky (laughs) horror picture show because they have her in like the worst looking pancake makeup and she has the curly hair too. It, yeah. I, the fact that the way the episode ends is they just trot him out into a sen- essentially an empty room and go, there's people here. Crowd noises are going to be piped in post pro. Okay. I can't believe that this was 22 minutes because God, it only felt like 50. <laughs> yeah. Right. It only felt like an hour and a half. And yeah. again, if the joke is he's a clown. Okay. But you don't need 20 minutes to tell that mm-hmm. story. Just don't. Do you hear music? I hear music. What, what is all this music? For? Sounds like there's a circus in town. I'm like, okay. And that music got really old really fast. It did. The bed that they use for the circus tunes here are, are dreadful. And as soon as he heard that music, I wrote, oh, he's a clown. That's where we're going, I guess. And then it was just a slow slide down to the circus. I will say that, yes, they're fooling nobody by having him in a darkened room with circus noise and crowd cheering. But I did think it was kind of cool that they that they took their entire lighting package and just strung it around the room and hung gels on them to simulate like circus lighting. I actually liked that. The other thing I liked is they go, he's been waiting for his car the whole time. So when the clown car showed up, I was like, oh, well, that's kind of clever. But when he got into it, all I could think was, why aren't there three dozen clowns dogpiling onto him right now? Yes. I mean, because because one man in a tiny clown car is still funny. It's a good image, ultimately. But here's the thing. This could have begun, and uh, Tales from the Dark Side, the spooky, spooky Paul Sparer, and then the window opens, Dick Sean in a clown car going, hey, I'm a politician. The end. If this was Night Gallery, that would have been what it was. <laughs> Somehow in Night Gallery, we complained that the blackout sketches were a little too long. And now it's just like, we're going all in 22 mm-hmm. minutes, baby. Oh, for the days of Jack Laird. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, for the days of yeah. what, what was that? Was it the one where it's the vampire leads the woman down to the crypt? And then he's like, I'm going to take my picture. That one. Like, I always think of that one because I'm like, that's done right. This is just like 22 minutes. Really? Don't we have 22 minutes to do on literally anything else? Mm hmm. Nope. And there's no Wolfman or Frankenstein or Dracula at all. Nope. Just a clown played by Dick Sean. Fail. All right. Next episode is Levitation. This is season one, episode 19. It aired originally on May the 19th, 1985, written by David Gerald, based on a short story by Joseph Payne Brennan. This one was directed by John Harrison, a stalwart here at Tales from the Dark Side, starring Joe Turkle. And you have burned so very, very brightly, Roy. It also stars Brad Cowgill and Cynthia Frost. Uh, This is a story of a magician who once performed a levitation act that may or may not have been real, and a young young magic fan who will not stop hounding him. What did you think of this one, Chris? 
I thought that this episode was called Well Cooked Hams. Father Malone, you should appreciate that one. No, it's not called Well Cooked Hams. That's the other magician episode that I can think of when I think of magician things from anthology shows. Or I guess it was Cooked Hams and the cat, the Joe Pants one where he's like the guy with nine lives. And so he's killing himself for real. Dig that cat. He's real gone. Dig that cat. He's real gone. I am so wary anytime these anthology shows approach the world of magic because I really have yet to see one that does this kind of thing well dig that caddy's real gone is good but for a completely different reason i think there was one other magic based episode in tales from the crypt with ernie hudson and a gorilla that he reads his mind yeah that's a wild episode this is just in 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 keeping with those kind of like weird takes on the circus this is another misplaced attempt at trying to i don't know what it's getting at ultimately but the final gag is funny. I'll give you that. But I think for most of it, I'm just like, what's the point here? What are we getting at? What are we driving at? What is this kid's obsession with magic? And then, oh, this is also kind of a blackout sketch, really. So what would happen if the hypnotist, it's like the setup of office space. What happens if the hypnotist dies before he can unhypnotize you? This asks the question, what happens if who's levitating you dies before he brings you back down? And scene. Good thing it was an open air Magic revival show. Tent. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it was a revival tent on top of everything else. Yeah. Yeah. That kid was so freaking obnoxious, especially when he starts heckling Joe Turkle and he's just like, well, show him the rope he didn't have. What about that other thing? I'm like, shut the fuck up, kid. Is this how you're going to get your way? And he ends up getting his way and then he gets his just desserts. Like you said, Chris, it's a total blackout skit. It, it should not be 22 minutes. It's like, Bing, bang, boom, let's get out of here. I am almost curious to track down the short story just to see how long it goes because I can't see it just going on for so long. Why do we need the friend? <laughs> we got to have somebody screaming to bring him back at the end to try and convince us that this guy floating away isn't better for everybody. Mm -hmm. No, we don't. This the the opening scene here represents something to me. I've noticed this in a couple of episodes, these tropes that, that bug the shit out of me in movies and television. People arriving at a location and then discussing the location. What did you talk about on the way there? What did mm -hmm. you talk about before you left the apartment as to where your destination was going to be? It's This is now not the time to discuss where we were going. You're at the fucking circus. And by the way, here's where we're going. Look up, it's the fucking circus. You should have raised your objections earlier. And just making him a magic fan gives it no stakes at all. He's just a kid who wants to see a trick performed. Why is he not a young magician who's coming up in the ranks and knows that this trick from 1960 will gain him all the fame? Tales from the Crypt would have done that. Tales from the Crypt did do that. <laughs> well, let me rephrase. Tales from the Crypt tried. I think that I found the original story and it is literally 500 words. Oh, good Lord. I could almost paste it in the chat. It's that short. I'll paste the URL to it, but yeah, I'm, I think this is the real deal. I don't think somebody expurgated it for the internet. Can you imagine someone doing that about this random episode of tales from the dark side mm -hmm. and the off chance that people are talking about it on a podcast and just like, Hey, we found the original text for this magician story. I got you. It's my version of the story. Ha <laughs> ha. What kind of psychopath are you? Yeah. I've been laying in wait for all these years. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the story ends the same way. Yeah. So the story gets us to the exact same position, which is your friend got what he deserved. Does anyone really deserve to float forever? That kid did, actually. I yeah, guess he so. did. He was a prick. Yeah. In yeah. fact, I, I, what bothered me at the end of the episode wasn't that this kid did this or that he was floating off to heaven. It was that they had the Joe Turkle <laughs> character <laughs> die. Like, I wanted him to just be like, you want levitation? Take it. And then the kid floats off. And then what, what are they going to charge him with a crime? Where's the body, <laughs> sir? <laughs> I do like that your that your assumption is he floated to heaven. <laughs> no, don't go to heaven. 
If they should have had those people from the madness room, should have been like, oh, we'll f- just float them away. <laughs> we'll float them into the atmosphere. Yeah, they might have called the Great Karma. Nice tip off, folks. Like, yeah. you're going to fuck with a guy named the Great Karma? Oh, yeah. Oh, hold uh. on. Oh, so on the nose, it hurts. Punch me in the face again. I didn't get it the first time. Now, as bad as the episode is, I would never want to be fixed in Joe Turkle's gaze. No. That guy could burn a hole in you. Also, I, th- I think if Joe Turkle grabbed my face and started telling me to sleep, I would do anything but. Oh, yeah. I'm just amazed at how well preserved he was in this episode because I'm like, how old is this guy? Because, of course, when he's Tyrell, he looks ancient especially with those huge fucking glasses even when he's lloyd he looks old but i thought he looked younger here than he did in the 70s he was 60 when blade runner came out wow and wow. he, he only great. passed a- passed away two years ago by the way at oh yeah the ripe old age of 94 I tried to get an interview, but then I was told, oh, he's very cantankerous. And I said, yeah, maybe I don't need to talk with him then. (laughs) He's very cantankerous, sir. He's 92. (laughs) Exactly. He has every right. Exactly. Can you imagine? I didn't sign up to be here this long. Good old Joe. He's the best part of this episode. Oh, God, yes. He uh, should have hosted a horror anthology show. He oh my could, God. Yeah. Can you oh, imagine that? And yeah. he could be a character in every single episode. <laughs> Even if he or just showed Karloff. up in the background or something. Yeah. But yeah, exactly that, like Karloff. Who doesn't know who Harry Houdini is? <laughs> Houdini. Ever heard of this Houdini guy? He's great. And along those lines, we all know Harry Houdini had nothing to do with levitation. Right. That's not what Tales from the Dark Side would lead me to believe. Mm -hmm. I did like that there was a Harry the Hat playing three-card Monty along the the boardwalk there. That was good. You mean the back lot that they just threw some canvas tarps over and claimed was a a circus? Because it looked like a back lot somewhere. (laughs) Better than that. They're inside a warehouse. Oh, great. I'm I'm actually impressed with the way that this one looks because I know it's a warehouse in Queens. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then fair. Yeah. Sure. This is an exterior episode filmed entirely in the interior, and I didn't. I never once thought we were in an interior. Me either. Yeah, hmm. good for them. It's just yeah. too bad it's this episode. Here's a choice bit of dialogue. Oh, man, they got freaks. That's going to be something neat, like a hermaphrodite. <laughs> Hell yeah. He gets it. He gets it. He understands. Yo, those freaky hermaphrodites. That's what, <laughs> that's what Eddie Murphy was talking about, right? <laughs> Freaky hermaphrodites. <laughs> who he picked up on, on Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> yeah, freaky hermaphrodites. Eddie Murphy and the freaky hermaphrodites. Oh my Why God. is that a thing? What? This is 1980-something, not 1965. Yeah, I don't remember, I don't remember any freaks and any circuits around me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, on top of everything else, why set this in the time and the place of the 80s. I'd be so creeped out if this guy was just doing guillotine action in a back alley somewhere in 1985. Like, okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, right, I, 75 miles to see this? All right. It would have been pretty cool if they had actually done a period piece and made this the 1950s. And I don't know more, why they couldn't. Yeah, make it a little bit more Nightmare Alley-ish. Well, and also then it would make perfect sense why that guy just floats away through an open-air tent. Yes, like, exactly. You don't have to explain that to anybody. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't have roofs back in the 50s. And it was and also by the way that open air tent was perfectly opened where he flew out to. It was like, and he can't move either. He can't grab anything. Is he hypnotized? Yeah, he's <laughs> under his control. Yeah. Yes, okay. Sure. His foot hits a rafter and he just goes spinning off. <laughs> <laughs> this one needs to be yeah, we yeah we need to just remake this one. Mm-hmm. And if we do, happened? we're yeah. not going to use the same goddamn circus music that they used in the last. Yes, goddamn exactly, episode. exactly. I was like, oh my god, this is the same bed. John is just... showing off his love of scrims here. He uses them pretty effectively here. He's going to use it a lot effectively in the Tales from the Dark Side movie eventually. That I, I also that uh, oh my favorite part of the episode is that he's securing his assistant into a guillotine, and they cut to the kid in the audience, and he says. This is kid stuff. It's like the French Ed, Revolution. Yeah. Pens being chopped off, bro. I know how they do that. Don't you know how they do that trick? It's just a fake blade. 
That see, here's the old other thing. How are we supposed to like this dickhead character who is the asshole in everybody's life who goes, "That's not magic." It's like, oh wow, fuck you. Like, well, actually, yeah, yeah the cup has a fuck you. If you're that person, you don't understand what the fucking point. It's a performance, and you're just an asshole. You're like heckling a comedian. You're an idiot. Except magicians can't bring you up on the stage and punch you in the fucking face like they deserve to. That's the problem. At least comedians get to heckle you back. That's the perk of the job, right? On a nuts and bolts level, was there no one working tech? Was there nobody manning the spotlights? Because the heckling went on way too long. Was there not oh, security yeah. or something? Somebody in the crowd pulled this kid out of there? There definitely was somebody working lights because at one point they shine this big light on <laughs> Turkle and I'm like, that seems like very inappropriate time to be shining the light on him and or like why wasn't it on before so there was one person but yeah they weren't calling security and not taking care of this obnoxious kid i also do love that harry houdini spoke to nobody but he spoke to you Mm -hmm. you're the line to houdini like this random fucking dude in a random again blackout sketches man what is tales from the dark side doing Mm. Oh, and this I, I, uh, was, in fact, the inspiration for the Prestige. So we have this to thank. So there you go. I might like this one a little better than the Prestige. I'm just going to leave you with the the. <laughs> the, the That's the, the hottest the, take right there, and you're just going to leave that one out there to fucking hang. Holy shit! Fuck Chris Nolan. I'm going to leave you with the words of Joe Turkle here, trying to lull you to sleep. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> Let your weight drop from your flesh. <laughs> That's what you should say every night when you're going to sleep. Now, good night. Go to sleep. Let your bones hit the pillow. God, Jesus, Joe Turk. The intensity that that man spoke. Woo. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Peter Serafinowicz's Dalek relaxation, relaxation tape? <laughs> Relax. Relax, <laughs> human. <laughs> now is time for relaxing. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay, on the next episode of Midnight Viewing, we'll be taking a look at two episodes from Season 1. It all comes out in the wash and Bigelow's Last Smoke. Midnight Viewing, the horror anthology podcast, is a proud member of Weirding Way Media Group, and our theme song was composed by HP. Till next time, what are you working on, and where can people find it, Chris Dashu? Weirdingwaymedia.com is where you can find everything that I work on and a whole bunch of other things that I don't except for one thing which can be found over on Mike's Patreon for the Projection Booth or my Patreon for the Culture Cast at patreon.com slash culture cast or Projection Booth respectively. And that is Rankin on Bond, where we spend one day a month talking about James Bond. We record it and let our Patreon listeners hear it. So $10 or more gets you access to that. And we're just getting started, so you have plenty of time to catch up. What about you, Mike White? Uh, pretty much the same thing. Everything's going over at weirdingwaymedia.com, including one of my favorite shows, Wake Up Heavy, where Mark Bigley comes on and talks about movies and talks with his daughter a lot, too, which is kind of cool. So nice show. Hearty, warm feelings. How about you, Father Malone? As for me, go over to weirdingwaymedia.com. You can hear me on this show. You can also hear me on Night Mr. Walters, a taxi podcast. It's hosted by HP, who composed our theme song. You can also hear Dark Destinations. That's a radio drama that I write and produce. Thank you all for joining us here at Midnight Viewing. Until next time, try to enjoy the daylight. Midnight Viewing, the horror anthology podcast, is a proud member of Weirding Way Media. Our theme song was composed by HP with an assist from Donald Rubenstein and Erica Lindsay. If you want to hear these episodes early and commercial-free, become a patron over at patreon.com slash fathermalone. Not only are the episodes up early, but we have extended interviews and bonus podcasts where we spotlight the best episodes of horror anthologies from every series. But if you just like the show and want to help, please share it with your friends and give us a rating on your favorite podcatcher. Together we'll keep journeying through the places that are just as real, but not as brightly lit. <laughs>